This is the Todd Capital Millionaire Podcast. This is episode 42. My name is Charles Oglesby, also known as Todd Millionaire. I'm the founder and the director of the Todd Capital Investment Club that now has over 200 members. I'm also the founder of Todd Acquisitions, which is our crowdfunded real estate firm, and Todd Ventures, our crowdfunded venture capital firm. Thank you all for tuning in. The purpose of this show is to share the stories of successful entrepreneurs and investors so that people can see that business and investing are the true keys to financial success and generational wealth. With us, we have a special guest. She goes by the name of... Aisha Selden. Aisha Selden. I, I'm, I'm trying to remember the intro, and then I forgot the name. That was rude of me. I apologize. Okay. Um, <laughs> Aisha Selden. Um, she is a real estate investor. She owns over, I believe, 25 properties. Um, and what's really cool is that she doesn't have any debt on most of those properties, so that's awesome. Um, she's also extremely accomplished professionally. So I really want this conversation to talk about her professional career and how she's seen success there. And we don't have to dive into any details that are confidential, of course, but I think that um, I was listening to a podcast and she was talking about how um, you're like the big wig in the corner and you were like a big deal. And I think that um, there are certain things maybe, maybe people can kind of take from that to see what skills and what things you were doing, what strategies that you were doing to help you achieve success in your career. I think that's important as well. I think that professional success and investment success kind of go hand in hand and they're both important. So with that, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. So um, I won't talk as much uh, specifically about the firm that I work for uh, outside of my real estate business, mostly because of um, we do have confidentiality agreements. I'm a licensed stockbroker. I have been for almost two decades now. Uh, and there are certain FINRA restrictions about advice that we can give out by a social media or podcast. So we do have limitations there, but um, essentially professionally, I am a franchise owner. So mm -hmm. I've been working um, as an advisor to clients for about 17 years. I started doing this right out of college um, in the stock ETF mutual fund world. Um, but I am an investor at heart. So for me, um, you know, and, and I was when the podcast that you saw uh, was for a real estate summit uh, that was held a, a few weeks ago. Um, and I always tell people because I do quite a bit of real estate investing, I, I tell people all the time that real estate is not life, investing is life. Hmm. So for me, I learned really early on that um, being a saver wasn't good enough. Um, I always tell people I had a, my aunt who recently passed away. Um, she had a, a, you know, she actually didn't even have a high school diploma or GED. Um, died uh, probably having made at best $25,000 a year mm -hmm. and she passed away owning her own home outright. She had no debt. Uh, all of her bills were current. She had over six figures in the bank um, and had a great uh, cash balance pension plan. So, you know, it's, it's not really about how much you make. It's, you know, she was obviously a, a saver. Had she been an investor, she probably would have passed with seven figures uh, in an investment in, in an investment account or in real estate or somewhere. So unfortunately, um, you know, culturally, not too many people teach us about how to invest uh, our money. For me, I am an investor. Real estate happens to be a great investment, but I invest in a lot of things. I invested in my franchise. Uh, I invest in uh, equities markets as well. Uh, so for me, it's all about where can I get the best risk adjusted return and real estate just happens to be one of those uh, places. Nice. Very cool. There's a lot to unpack there, um, but I guess we'll kind of go back to the beginning. Um, can you tell us about where you went to school, what you studied while you were in school? So I um, graduated from Temple University with um, a dual degree in economics and marketing uh, with a minor in communications, oddly enough. So instead of graduating early, which I was on track to do, I just started picking up stuff because I wanted to get the full, the full four-year experience, um, and college was free for my sister and I, so... Um, I wanted to get, you know, every piece of knowledge that I could. So um, I worked at a bank as a bank teller while I was in college. Um, so that kind of introduced me to the financial services world. Um, I was offered a position as uh, a financial representative at the bank, but decided I wanted to do more of a, have more of an eat what you kill um, opportunity, uh, because I think that you know, if, if I'm in a position where um, I can go out and generate business, you'll typically do better. And, and that was a, 
that was a good bet for a 21, 22 year old to make in it and it paid off because had I been in the banking channel, I probably wouldn't have done as well and probably wouldn't have a, you know, fr- have had a franchise opportunity. Mm-hmm. You probably would have hit a ceiling as opposed to there being no ceiling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was, um, I was fortunate enough where I think I was like maybe 23, 24 years old and I was already making six figures. Wow. So yeah, it's, it's, you know, when people say, well, you know, it, People ask me all the time, Aisha, how do you, you know, you mentioned earlier, um, I have 25 properties and of the 25, I have four mortgages um, and one's pretty small, like, you know, it's actually a, an equity line of credit um, that I could pay off, you know, at any time. So I really have three mortgages on 25 properties and people say all the time, well, you know, how can I be in a position to do something like that? Well, I've been making, you know, six figures since I was an early 20 something year old. Yeah. So I've accumulated quite a bit of capital because I was very frugal. I was very cheap. And, and you heard me say on that other podcast that, you know, people who are in a position to do well tend to tend to fail, um, I think, because of discipline really early on. So as a 22, 23 year old, you know, most kids, I mean, that's still a kid. You're making that much money. Most of them would be like in Miami, you know, posted up with a Bentley on Instagram or most of them would be in these ridiculously lavish houses um, at that time, uh, I was buying a $67,000 uh, foreclosed property, which ended up being my first property, um, in a not so lavish area. It was in West Philly, and I was making great money, but I saw it as a savvy and wise investment. Um, I didn't shop for clothes. I was very frugal. I was really cheap. So I spent a bulk of my 20s making sacrifices that most people probably wouldn't make. Um, I remember, I think the year I was 27 or 28, I made close to a half a million bucks that year. Um, and I, and I saved like almost all of it. So, you know, I, I think I was in a very different position than most, but at the same time, um, I think I was very diligent with the position that I'd been put in. Um, because you know, you, you've got people, you know, I was talking to a a buddy of mine uh, earlier today on, on Instagram and he said, you know, I know people who, you know, make $200,000 a year and have a lower net worth than like someone who's making, you know, 20 grand a year, because it is in fact not how much you make, it's about how much you keep. Yeah. So I made those sacrifices really early on. So for me, that's how I've been in the position to do what I do now. And now I actually, um, it's, it's funny because I look at myself today versus how I was for most of my 20s and even into my early 30s, very frugal, very focused, very disciplined. Um, in terms of my expenses and and what I spent. And now I think I'm finally at that point where um, I'm probably more lavish than, than I've ever been, but Mm -hmm. it's, it's been, you know, it's been a lot of sacrifice and and hard work, but I'm still, I'm still a bit of a miser, still a little cheap in certain places. No, it speaks to a lot of what I talk about. I talk heavy on frugality. And um, for me, most of my early 20s, I didn't really see that I was trying to be that person on Instagram, having everything. And I got around a guy who um, can do whatever he wants financially. He's worth a ton of money and he doesn't. And I realized like, that's what it is. Like you start seeing the people who have money and don't spend money and they use that money to go out there and build assets and buy assets and accumulate real wealth. They're the people that are making it versus you have the people who make 200,000, live like they make 300,000. And they're going backwards. You know, it's funny because by profession, um, I'm basically a financial counselor. And, you know, my colleagues, um, you know, when we were new advisors, you know, we'd we'd go to each other and say, oh, your client's in the lobby. Our new client is in the lobby. The the prospects you've been waiting for, they're they're here to see you. Um, And, you know, someone, some of them would ask, the ones that didn't make it, who just didn't get it, they'd say, well, you know, did you see the car they pulled up in? Was it a nice car? Because I want, you know, they wanted to make sure that the client, the potential client had a lot of money. Um, and for me, I actually thought the exact opposite. And I, I'll never forget these one particular clients. I walked out into the lobby and saw them. Um, and the husband had on like this tweed jacket where, you know, he had holes where he had patched them up and the wife had on this like 1946 dress, like this big old weird belt. I mean, like they look like, thrift store 101 and i remember having the biggest smile on my face because before i even sat down and discussed their financial situation with them i was like i know they have money i absolutely know they do because no one this thrifty looking um because they're obviously not spending it on on uh money he you know he dropped his key uh, on clothes he dropped his keys and it was like i don't know a dodge or something and i was absolutely right 
So, you know, where I typically see the most wealth, kind of that millionaire next door um, person, it, you know, they typically, they don't care about, you know, the sneakers they have on. They don't care about all the just crap that, um, you know, becomes so important to us. Um, and by us, I don't even mean just, you know, people say all the time, well, black people only care about is blank. No, I mean, you look at the average lottery winner, the average ball player, the average celebrity, not just the black ones end up, you know, filing chapter 11. You know, that's, that's just, you know, I don't know if it's a Western culture thing. Um, you know, most people just aren't taught to manage their finances properly. And I think before you invest, that's the first place you have to start. You've got to make sure that you're disciplined enough to um, manage your funds appropriately because otherwise it's just going to be a disaster. And we see it all the time. How many investors do you know who've ended up, who've ended up over uh, leveraging, losing everything, um, either be it in stocks or real estate, they've taken out these huge margin loans and all this other crap, um, and way over extending themselves and not even for investment purposes, but because of lifestyle purposes. Um, and that's just lack of discipline. So. So I have two questions for you. The first is um, what motivated you to be so frugal? And the second is what do you think allows you to do so well in your career so early on? Yep. So I've got, a, I've got a story and hopefully it's not too long of a story because it, it, it helped me figure out the types of people really early on in life. Um, and I will say that I was like born, like I was, I was born a cheap kid. You know, <laughs> that's something innate in me. And I think that for most people, that's got to be, um, you've got to be taught that. So when I was a kid, my mom sent me to um, a Christian camp, right? So I think I was maybe a friend of mine. And she sent me with $200 and it was an overnight camp. We were, we were staying there for five days. And at the camp we had to pay for, they paid for, um, lo they took care of lodging, but we had to pay for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for five days. And my mom sent me with 200 bucks, which you're thinking, you know, this is back in what the eighties, early nineties, 200 bucks for a kid. That was a lot of money. So I go down there. Um, I've got my 200 bucks. Um, we convene, it's a whole bunch of kids, and I'll never forget that within like the first few hours that the camp started, the counselors put us all in like a circle, and they had this little kid there, and they're like, you know, uh, Scott, who's here, he spent all of his money like within the first couple of hours, right? So they're like the Christian thing to do, because he's now got to be here like another four and a half days, he has no money. The Christian thing for everyone to do would be for everyone to like chip in and help Scott, you know, last the rest of the week. And I remember thinking even as a 12, 13 year old, no one told Scott to spend all of his money. You know, Jesus certainly wouldn't have done that. Um, so I was, I was annoyed, slightly peer pressured into like, cause I was, I was cheap um, and certainly not a giver at that time. I was annoyed and peer pressured into like, I think I, I remember, remember giving him five bucks and everyone kind of chimed in and gave him, gave him some money. Um, progressing throughout, um, the week, uh, the friend who I went down there with, um, she actually ended up, um, managing her money well enough, but I remember she was in like the gift shop. I want to buy souvenirs for my mom. I want to buy, you know, a baby bird for, you know, my sister, you know, don't you want to get something for your mom, your sister? And I'm like, no, like they don't even, my mom don't even like birds. Like, I don't want to get any souvenirs. I'm not getting anybody any gifts. Like this is my money. It's supposed to last me all week. She timed it so that her, um, reserves that she went down there literally she spent her last dime like as we were leaving so she was good enough in at least not you know like scott spending all of his money within like the first few hours she budgeted all her money but left without a dime um i went home and i had 175 dollars after i left um and i took the money i put it in a shoebox and put it under my bed so you know in retrospect thinking retrospect thinking back um I only spent $25 over a five day period and that's for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, including the five bucks I gave to Scott. So that's just kind of how I was. Wow. But that dawned on me really early on. There's a few different types of people. One, there's a person like Scott who I think is unfortunately a lot of people. Um, that's the guy who, we're not even talking living paycheck to paycheck. That's the financial disaster. That's the person who's always filing chapter 11. The person who, you know, they're always spending their, I mean, it's, it's, it's the person, you know, that you hear like, Jesus, how many times are you going to file bankruptcy? Um, my friend who I went down there is, I think like most people, that's the paycheck to paycheck person. That's, and that's, that's, I think most people, you know, by like the Friday they're getting paid, their stomach's rattling, um, you know, because they literally lasted just to that day. 
um, which require, you know, the problem with that person is any emergency that comes up, the hot water tank in your house explodes, your four tires blow out, you need a new roof. That's a person that ultimately finds themselves in financial disaster anyway, because it's, you know, expenses are going to happen as a result of emergency. And then I was the third type of person who was the saver, um, you know, where obviously I, I, I was frugal with my money. I came home, I parked the money under my bed, but I'm happy that I learned really early on, um, I think right around like age 21 or 22, that the type of person that I was, which was um, person number three, which is a saver, that uh, because my, my aunt, who I talked about earlier, she was that saver. Um, but ultimately, you obviously have to get to the fourth type of person, which is an investor. And yeah. there's a variety of different ways that you can invest either in a business, like a franchise, in real estate, stocks and investments. Um, and I was fortunate enough to have learned really early on that being a saver wasn't just enough. So it was innate in me to save. It was innate in me to be frugal. Um, it was not innate in me to be an investor, but I had to learn that. So I think that, you know, when I'm talking to people about um, figuring out how they can do better financially, I think the first thing is trying to identify which type of person they are. You know, if they're a Scott, they got a hell of a long way to go. Um, if they're, you know, the person who's the paycheck to paycheck, they're a little further along, but you got to get to saver and then get to investor. And obviously if you're a saver, that's just not enough either because most people think, oh, I know how to save money. Being a saver doesn't necessarily mean you're a great investor. So to answer your question, that was kind of innate in me to be just that, a saver, to be frugal. Um, but I actually had to learn through trial and error, researching a lot. Um, I got caught up in the dot-com tech bubble burst. You know, I got caught up in like, oh, okay, now that I'm starting to invest, I can I want to throw my money in Qualcomm or, you know, all these um, internet companies. So I had to like learn a lot of things along the way um, about risk and, and what's a good investment. I study and read a lot of Warren Buffett. So now I'm at the point where um, I'm trying to be kind of like a hybrid of that fourth person, which is not only just to be in, an investor, but to be a disciplined investor. Because it's really easy to get caught up, I think, in, um, you know, I, I don't want to rag on Bitcoin, um, but, you know, <laughs> it's, it's really easy to get caught up in these frenzies, you know, yeah. these feeding frenzies. Um, you know, it looks great. It looks lavish. It's making a lot of money. Um, but a disciplined investor does not get caught up in frenzies. Um, and fortunately, um, I've seen enough over the last couple of decades of being an investor, I've seen enough situations go bad. So it's funny because I watch a lot of these young guys who are now coming up and this is their first um, foray into, you know, oh, it's a real estate boom, you know, I want to make a lot of money. And I've seen these things go south before. So I'm, I'm cautioning people, stay cautious, you know, make sure that you're watching the trends, make sure that you're watching the market, don't over leverage. Um, invest, but also make sure that you're taking very calculated risks. Right. Nice. It's a lot there. Um, of course, you're spitting flames, but it's so funny because I'm anti-Bitcoin, but I think that a lot of what you're saying, um, coming from a Buffett perspective, also kind of talks about like your tech stocks, your social media companies, your Netflix, or not Netflix, but your Snapchat, your um, Twitter. Yep. Um, if you're somebody like uh, Buffett, who, in my opinion, I think he's always kind of been anti-Twitter and Snapchat. Um, yeah, you don't get I mean, really caught up you know, in the hype. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's, um, you know, it's it's tough to say um, something's a sound investment and it doesn't make any money. You know, Twitter uh, has a negative uh, P.E. ratio. Uh, Snapchat has a negative P.E. ratio. So it's really hard to say, yeah, this is a great investment. How is it a great, great investment and the company's not making any money? That, by the way, is not any stock advice. You know, let me just give the disclaimers. But um, yeah, it's, it's, but you know, it's really easy to get caught up when you watch something accelerate so significantly, you get caught up. Um, and you know, Buffett talks a lot about, you know, when everyone's running out of a building, that's when you run in. And when everyone's running in a building, you run out. Um, because, you know, we get so caught up in, in, fear and greed uh, drive and, and push a lot of our financial decisions. And the reality, yeah. you know, that's how people get caught up. Awesome. 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 So can you talk to us about your early investments? Mm -hmm. So my, um, my first investment, and I'll, I'll stick to real estate on this um, because obviously I've been doing um, uh, equity investments along the way, stock investments. But um, so my very first property, was a property in Philadelphia. Um, I bought a 
foreclosed property um, paid $67,000 for the house. Today, it's, it's actually not worth significantly more, but I've been renting it since 2004. So I've been renting it now the last 13 years. It is by far paid for itself times over. Um, and it's worth today probably around 180000 or so. Um, I've I use that property, and I talk a lot about um, a strategy that I didn't even know it had a name when I started using it, but most people are probably familiar today with the BRRRR strategy or however many R's. So I bought the house. I fixed it up. I lived there for a couple of years, and when I moved to Virginia, um, I, I rented the property. Um, right around 2011, which I think was probably like end of 2011 into 2012 was like the bottom of the Philadelphia real estate market. So I had that property still, which was a rental. Um, I decided to pull some equity out of that property uh, and use it as leverage to invest in more property. So I basically took a look around at the landscape and said, all right, the market's crashed. Um, if you recall, in 2011, 2012, there weren't too many investors that could get financing. Banks really, really tightened the belt, uh, the, the purse strings on lending because, I mean, we literally almost as, a, as an economy collapsed because of, um, you know, overextending, not, you know, these new doc loans, which almost collapsed our economy. But anyway, so I, I went back to that initial property that I had. I pulled equity out. I think I pulled about $50,000, $55,000 out of that initial property. Um, I went to an area in Philadelphia, South Philadelphia, uh, which is where I'm from, and I also saw opportunity in the market. I bought a property, I paid 56,000 for it. So I had 54, 55,000 from this equity line. I had some cash of my own, um, put not a whole lot of work into it. I mean, I literally just slapped some paint over the wooden panels, put some new carpet in. I mean, I didn't do it very lavishly um, and rented the property out. So I had at that point a free and clear property because I paid cash for it from the equity line for my first property. Um, I fixed it up, rented it. I took the uh, lease that I had for that new tenant. I took that down to my credit union and said, hey, look, I've got a property. It's in South Philly, it's rented, here's the lease. Can you give me a loan against this free and clear property? Um, because I, you know, I don't owe anything on it. And they did. Um, so for, you know, even banks knew at that time, it was a fairly low risk investment here. They, I was only asking for um, maybe 60, 70% of the, you know, the, the value of it as a percentage. So 60, 70% LTV. They gave me a loan. I took about another 50,000 or so, added some more of my own money, and I went and bought another property. So um, that's where you have the, the buy, the rehab, the rent, I refied, and then I repeated it. So I literally took the cash that I got as a loan from that South Philly property, and I went around the corner and bought another South Philly property. Um, and I literally did that repeatedly, um, mm. like just a lot of times. So, so can I interject here? Um, a lot of people, what they do when they buy a property and they rehab it, they sell it. Um, what was the purpose of you renting it out as opposed to just getting that cash like most people would do? So for me, again, investor, um, my thought process is why would I sell it? You know, I, I, if it's, if I'm an investor and I always consider, and again, Buffett rule is that, you know, when you buy an investment, it should be a long-term investment. Um, the thought, the thought of like, you know, I don't need the cash now. I'm, I'm investing money. So why would I, you know, why would I sell? Like, I don't even think that way. Um, I think I want, if I'm buying a property, I'm buying it because I see long-term appreciation. I see long-term income from it. Um, and again, this goes back to, I'm not buying properties to enhance my lifestyle. Um, I'm buying it because it's a, a sound investment. And if it's a sound investment today, it will be a, a more sound investment 15 years from now. Um, in retrospect, so these houses that I bought in South Philly that were 50,000, 56,000 that are now worth probably somewhere in the vicinity of 250 to 300,000, um, plus they've been rented now for the last six years. So I've already made my money back. Um, I'd be sick if I had sold them. I would physically be ill if I'd sold these properties. So yeah, it, I, and I do sell a couple of properties. So I, I, I actually sold one this year. Um, it was intentionally purchased as a, as a rehab flip. Um, and I sold one last year um, that was also purchased as a flip. But oddly enough, the buyers who bought my flip last year, I bought their house 
uh, when they bought mine. Yeah. So, yeah. That's cool. It's funny because I kind of see investing the same way. It's like you see all these people making money flipping. You see all these people making money wholesaling. I and mean, wholesaling is great, but um, it never appealed to me. I never knew why it never appealed to me. Um, we just bought a house recently and we're just going to sit on it and let it cash flow. Um, that's all we want to do is just let it cash flow every single month. I have no desire to sell it. I do think we paid for it free and clear. I do kind of want to see if I can get a loan on it. So that we can pull that money out and then go buy the next deal. Absolutely. Um, when you did that, did you go to one bank and they just approved you right then and there? Or did you have to shop around to different banks? Um, no. I, so that first loan, I went to just one bank. Um, and then I started to get to that point because I had a lot of loans um, at, after a while. So, you know, I, I did the strategy and then I went, you know, I did it again. I did it again. And around 2012, where the banks were still pretty stringent, they're like, all right, sis, you got eight loans, you know. Mm -hmm you need to do something different because we're not going to just keep giving you all these loans. So my credit union actually had um, a different side of the bank where they would lend to me um, from a, uh, on a commercial side. So I was using the same bank. I was just using commercial loans instead of traditional conventional loans. So however you can do it. And then again, this goes back to the discipline because if I, if I had to do things all over again, um, I absolutely, I absolutely would. But as soon as I could pay those loans off, that's exactly what I did. Um, I, think I, I think at one point I hit maybe nine or 10 loans. Um, but, you know, I've since just kind of been knocking them out. And, and now I'm down to the three, lo the three loans and the one home equity line of credit. Um, but instead of using the rent for income, because again, I still have my, my nine to five. Um, instead of using the rent for lifestyle, I just started using those loans to just pay down those mortgages. Um, well, you know, it, it all just gets reinvested. Yeah. It's funny. I was listening to a podcast the other day and he said that the best investment for his cash flow is paying down the debt on his current properties. Absolutely. Absolutely. And people look at you crazy, like you're crazy when you say that. They're like, what do you mean? You know, if you get a tax write off with the interest. And I'm, you know, it always blows my mind when people say, you know, I borrow so that I can have um, a tax deduction. It, that's basically saying I'm paying a dollar to save 30 cents, um, which makes zero sense. It's like, you know, I, I don't even understand that thought process. You know, so you're going to pay a bank a dollar so that you can get 30 cents of it back. You know, is that why you're borrowing? No, that's not why you're borrowing, because that doesn't even make mathematical sense. So, um, you know, for me, and again, I'm a much more conservative investor because I've been through, um, you know, I've been through 2008, I've been through, you know, 9-11, you know, where, where markets pull back significantly. And I've seen the impact of what that can do to both the stock portfolio and a real estate portfolio. Um, and I remember what high leverage does uh, to investors. Which is interesting. And I wanted to ask you about that because you have all these properties with no debt. Um, and most people, they wouldn't do that. They would do it the complete opposite. Most people are trying to put as much debt on their real estate as possible. I mean, for different reasons. Some people want to protect it from lawsuits. Some people want to just enhance their buying power. Yep. But um, and I'm not sure if we really covered it. Maybe we glossed over it. But what's the motivation for paying them off and keeping them paid off? Um, so I'm actually in the process right now. And, and I, don't, um, I don't disagree with some of those other reasons that you mentioned that investors are, are leveraged. And keep in mind, at one point, I was pretty leveraged. I wasn't, I wasn't at like 80, 90% loan to value like you see some investors. But at one point, I had a lot of loans and it was necessary at the time. So um, back in 2011, when I was buying aggressively, um, the only thing I could do was, did, did you lose some? Yeah, give me one second. <laughs> I don't know why that happened. There we go. Um, so at one point I was, you know, very highly leveraged. So when it's necessary, leverage, do what you got to do. Um, I had to do that at the time. So I, I won't argue with someone um, that says, you know, I got to take on the debt. That's the only way I can enhance my purchasing power. I've been there, done that. And I would do it all over again. Um, I'm just in a different position. I can be more conservative. Um, and so I choose to, I just choose to take a more conservative. Uh, okay. route. Um, I am in the process right now of applying for a loan, which I haven't done in about five years. And um, the loan officer is probably a little annoyed at me because he's been asking me for paperwork, which is just annoying to me. I don't like banks. I don't like, well, we want this from you because, the, you know, these are the reasons I don't like 
borrowing because they, they nitpick at you, they wanna ask you things and you're at their mercy. You know, I, I start feeling like I'm at, you know, someone's beck and call, um, which is why you should be the lender, not the borrower. Um, so, you know, I, I, do, I do think that borrowing can have um, its benefits. I'm in the process, I'm not trying to, get a, trying to get a loan, I'm actually trying to get a line of credit. I want a blanket line of credit against um, a handful of my properties, um, simply because if something comes up, an opportunity comes up, um, a large purchase that I want to do, maybe an apartment building, or even if I find a plot of land um, that I want to build on personally, I just want to be able to do it at a moment's notice and not have to then go through, you know, 45 day, yeah. 60 day loan process. Yeah, awesome. So I want to talk to you about a deal that one of the only deals, well, not the only, but the most specific deal that I know of, and I guess you call it the beast. Um, I kind of want to know um, if you can give us an idea of what that property consists of yep. um, and your strategy with that property. Yep. So I'm glad you asked that because um, so my portfolio right now consists or prior to about a month ago has consisted of 100% single family residences. And it's so funny because, you know, People who have single family residents are like, single family residences are always like, well, I wish I had multifamilies. People who have multifamilies who are like, oh, I wish I had single families. So I've been saying for a while, I want to add multis to my portfolio. I've been all single family. I just purchased my first multi, which is the beast. So this is um, a property that I paid 40000 for, 41000 or so for, um, which is right near uh, Temple University Hospital, right near Temple Med School uh, in Philadelphia. It's so one block off of Broad Street, which is the main street that runs all the way through um, Philadelphia end to end. Um, so from a location standpoint, um, I think it's great. It's still a little rough, but that's a lot of Philly. I mean, you know, most of Philly is like, eh, good luck. Um, so my goal um, prior to going into any property is to have a 20% cap rate. So I, I have to know um, going into a property that between my purchase, the closing costs, and all rehab costs, I'm going to make at least a 20% rate of return. So basically that means I'm going to get my money back in approximately five years. Oh, yeah. So I, um, so this property paid 40,000 for it, 41,000 for it. And um, it's going to cost me about 165,000 or so. Uh, to rehab, to turn it into a four unit property. Um, I'm estimating probably somewhere in the vicinity of $45,000 a year in rent, which means it puts me right at about my cap rate. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So that's the beast. We'll see how it goes. It's going to, it's a big project. I mean, the house, the house is a total shell. I'm trying to make four units. I'm I'm making an apartment in the basement where technically there, there is not even an entrance for it that we're going to have to build out and dig out for. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. This is my, this will be my largest project. So you mentioned that um, it's not, that property is not in the best neighborhood. You mentioned that your first property wasn't in the best neighborhood. Um, how do you manage buying in a not so great neighborhood, but also making it profitable? Um, the hood is the most profitable. I mean, that's what I think most investors fail to realize. Um, you know, obviously it's all about risk. So, you know, if you're going into, you know, someone was telling me, and I live here in downtown Philly, they're probably the, the most affluent area of Philadelphia is called Rittenhouse Square. And someone was telling me they're selling a, a, an, an income property in Rittenhouse Square, and they were selling me on the benefit of being able to get a, I think it was like a 7 or 8% rate of return. And I was like a seven or eight percent rate of return. Like, why would I do that? Why would anyone do that? I could put my money in a mutual fund and make seven or eight percent and never get a phone call about a broken toilet. Um, so the more hood you go, the, the better your returns. And again, I say, you know, rough areas, but there are far rougher areas in Philly that I actually even won't venture into. Um, but the more risk that you're taking on, meaning your safety, you know, if you got to if you got to walk out with the 380 out in the air, you know, that's obviously a little bit more, more of a risk that you're taking. Um, your return should, in fact, be higher. So the 20 percent cap rates that I have that are in some of these um, rougher sections of Philly, I would get a far lower return if I was in a safer neighborhood or in downtown Philly or in University City. Um, but I'd also get a higher rate of return. I've got a, an investor friend of mine who invests solely in Kensington. Another one invests in Chester. Um, and their get their cap rates are like 
35, 40%. I mean, it's, and I've considered it like, well, you know, um, but I just, it's, it's not worth it to me. 20% is good enough. Um, and, you know, I, I do value my life. So I'm just not willing to go more aggressive, even for a better return. These 20% areas are areas that I'd feel comfortable, you know, being in personally. Nice. Very cool. So it sounds like you focus solely on the Philly area. Mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a world today where you can invest nationwide, why do you still stay local? I have control issues, um, and I'm okay with that. Uh, I, I need to see it. I need to roll up on it. I need to, if a tenant's acting crazy, I'm, I need to knock on that door personally. I mean, I'm, I get, you know, I'm in my suit and pearls now, but, you know, I'll roll up on them. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I need to physically be able to see it. And all of my properties, not all of them are in Philly. I have two in the suburbs outside of Philly. Um, but they're all in driving distance. If I have to get there, I can get there. And I can't, you know, I've had a property catch on fire, um, actually two different properties. Well, one it was a house two doors down. Um, the thought of not being able to be there, I mean, some investors are fine with it. I, I just, I'm not. Um, and also, you know, you got, you, you know, you guys are out in California. If I were in California, I would be investing in Philadelphia or some other city where the prices are lower. I can get, you know, decent returns. I don't even know how people invest. Um, you know, I was in, I was in uh, the Bay Area this weekend and, you know, I was riding through East Palo Alto, which is a rough, you know, neighborhood, unlike Palo Alto, which is very nice. East Palo Alto is supposed to be the hood. Um, I rolled up on what looked like a whole shack and it was like 600 grand. I'm like, how are, how are investors doing this? So I happen to be in an area that's conducive to my control issues. I don't have to go outside of Philadelphia um, because I've got a great market right here in my backyard. But if I was in a California or if I was in a New York City or if I was in, you know, some, uh, uh, Seattle, I would, um, I would invest outside of the area. I'd have to get over my control issues. I just don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. So you have your own franchise. You also have a pretty significant rental portfolio. How do you manage both? So I'm not married um, and I don't have kids. So typically the time that people spend with spouse or kids, I'm doing real estate. You know, I'm usually up earlier than everyone else. I'm usually up at, you know, four or five o'clock in the morning. I work out and then I'm handling real estate stuff uh, before the stock market opens. Um, and you see what I'm doing at almost nine o'clock at night. And I literally just walked in. I had a bunch of conference calls, um, client meetings all day today. Um, I'll do real stuff, real estate stuff at night on the weekends. I mean, it's, it's a full time. Actually, I think I have two full time jobs. Um, but I work a lot and I'm okay with that. At some point I'll decide enough is enough and I'll, I'll you know, be a philanthropist and, per, you know, professional vacationer. Uh, but I'm okay with working hard now. Cool. So um, we know about the beast. What are your other goals for the future in regards to real estate? So I, you know, I've always said I want a hundred mailboxes. Um, and a part of the reason I want to get into multis, um, because I actually love single family residents investing. Um, you know, they're, they're easier to rent, uh, tenants tend to stay much longer. If they're in a three bedroom, one, you know, one bathroom, 12, 1300 square foot property, my turnover is a lot less than a tenant being in a two bedroom, 700 square foot property. I mean, it's, it's, um, I like my single family portfolio, um, but I am incorporating multi multi units because I do want to get to 100 mailboxes. Oops. So, yeah, so that's kind of my goal. And once I get there, I'll sort of determine what do I want to do? Do I want to, you know, sell them all and buy just a few apartment buildings, commercial, uh, commercial investing, you know, we'll, we'll see. Or I just may want to hang on to them, hire a property manager and, you know, have less involvement in the day-to-day -day aspects. Uh, but that's my goal. Nice. So what advice would you give to somebody who's looking to get to where you are? I was going to say get into real estate, but I think a better and more direct question is get to where you are. So provided the person has passed, um, you know, kind of that, that asset test of where they are. So, you know, we talked about the first person, you know, going back to that camp example, we talked about you know, going from a, a Scott to, you know, there was a Quincy in the middle. Quincy was the friend of mine who was kind of like that live to paycheck to paycheck child, but hopefully she's changed it as an adult. Then there was me who was the saver. And then obviously you have the, the pinnacle, which is the investor. So the first thing is, you know, 
I determine where you are on that curve because I think unfortunately too many people say because it looks great and now invest real estate investing seems to have a bit of a buzz because everyone's talking about it even Jay Z's talking about it on his album um, you know so everyone's like I, you know I want to get into real estate investing I can do this so I think the first thing is figuring out where on that curve you actually are because quite frankly if you're a Scott to jump and dive into real estate investing it's going to go very badly probably relatively quickly um, and maybe like you know not permanently you know financially detrimental but it could scar you for a long time um, so first obviously figure out where you are um, and then make sure that you can get from Scott to you know Aisha enhanced uh, making sure that you're not just an investor but a disciplined investor um, and whatever it is, you know, people need a variety of different things to get them from, you know, I don't even know how to manage money, which is obviously a huge issue if you're trying to be a real estate investor to um, passing being a saver to actually knowing how to be a disciplined investor. Um, you know, people, sometimes people need a variety of different things, counseling, reading a book, an exorcism, whatever it is that people need to do to get past, you know, um, you know, how to better manage their, their, their funds. Um, because, you know, as a real estate investor, you know, we get tons of cash all of a sudden, you know, we sell a building or we sell, you know, we, we, we get a, an influx of money. Um, and sometimes it is kind of hard to make that decision. I sold a, a property this year um, and got a two hundred and thirty some thousand dollar check at once. Like most people will be like, you know, I'm out, quit the job, like, you know. Right you know, F all y'all, you know, you know, you throw in your middle finger, everybody, and they would be, you know, ball all the way out. You're like, some people just can't even, can't handle it. I didn't spend one dime of it personally. I mean, I used some of it to buy a new property and now I'm using um, a bulk of it to reinvest in the beast. Um, so, you know, making sure that you know that you're um, at a place where you can obviously handle it. Um, and then from there, really just reading and digesting as much information on how to be a good investor. Um, what trends should you be looking for? What is your marketplace? You know, you should know your market kind of inside and out. You know, people say to me all the time, I, you know, I want to invest in properties in my neighborhood. And I'm like, okay, well, what neighborhood do you want to be in? Well, I don't know. Well, you know, what are the median rents in the area that you're looking at? I don't know. It's like, you know, these are all things that you have to know and you have to research. You've got to do a lot of diligence. I'm constantly on Zillow. I'm constantly on Realtor.com. I'm, con I'm on like every wholesaler list in the city um, because I want to know exactly what's out there. You know, if there's some deals I want to know about, even if I got to pass up on them, I at least want to know what's going on. Yeah. So there's a lot of steps and it, it takes a lot of work and studying and due diligence, but it's, I think, worth it. And, and this stuff has got to be interesting to you. You know, people are like, well, I want to invest in real estate, but it's really not interesting to them. I mean, like, do you light up when you are when you talk about investments? I mean, and I'm a fairly um, introverted person. You know, you want to get me talking, get me talking about real estate. You know, if, if you know, someone is asking me questions about makeup and MAC lipstick, you know, I'm not going to say a word, but um, I don't think I've shut up on this, uh, this interview. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So who are some people that you look up to? and why? Um, obviously, uh, Warren Buffett, um, huge, huge uh, influence. I think arguably probably the best and greatest investor. Um, I've, I've read his book, um, was it Snowflake or Snowball or something like that? He's got a really good book um, that talks about and follows his, um, his life story, um, which I think is wildly fascinating. It's a long it's a, book. It's a long book. It's, I'm only like halfway through it. <laughs> you know, that, that's an investment right there. I mean, you, you, you really could, you got to commit to that one because it's, it's, a, it's a long book. He even has, um, there's a documentary um, that's, that was on HBO or Showtime or something that was, you know, on his life as well, which just utterly fascinating to me. Um, other investors I, I, I admire, I have a real estate partner who's, um, she actually owns outside of our real estate portfolio. Uh, she owns several daycares here in Philly. Um, incredible business mind. I mean, she is a business owner. She is an entrepreneur. Um, and she, you know, it, it's, it's great because we have a partnership. And I think that if you're, if you're going to invest with a partner, you need to find someone who compliments you. So things I don't like to do, she's, you know, she likes to do and she's great at and vice versa. So we can, you know, bounce things off of each other. We can good cop, bad cop. We can, you know, we're a good team, I think. Um, and I, you know, I, I certainly admire and respect her. Um, 
I mean, I've got, you know, I've got partners in my fr- in my franchise. Um, I got a lot of friends, family who kind of keep me, uh, keep me grounded um, because I can get so like work focused. I can get so like, you know, all I will do is work. Um, and my family and my friends kind of keep me, I think, balanced, which I respect immensely because um, I will work my life away. Uh, and fortunately I have you know, family and friends who won't allow me to do that. So, yeah. Very cool. All right, so I have a question that I got from Twitter. Um, Somebody had this question. It's not stock related, but it is personal finance related. I'll read it so I don't mess it up. It says, I'm at 150,000 in savings, but I'm 150,000 behind my goal at age 41. Aside from maxing out my 401k, what route should I take to catch up aggressively, as aggressively and safely as possible? You know, it, it depends. I like that end point and safely as possible. It depends on, um, you know, I always say there's a, there's a couple different ways to invest. is what I consider like 401ks and, and, and mutual fund investments. Um, you know, arguably, you don't even really need to understand how a mutual fund works or how, you know, how a stock works in order to invest in it. It is lazy. It's never going to bother you at 3 a.m. It's never going to call you. It's never going to be late with the rent. Sure, it will fluctuate with the market, but it is the laziest possible way of investing. Um, on the flip side, you have money that you're going to work harder for, but it's also going to yield you a greater return. So, you know, me personally, um, I think the safest investment is real estate um, because, I mean, you and I both know there are things that, you know, catastrophe you insure against. I mean, you know, the house burns to the ground, you know, you insure against. Someone trips on your pavement and wants to sue you, you insure against. I mean, the things that arguably could really, really um, be a catastrophe you insure against with real estate, you will always have a brick. And as long as you provide relatively good housing, someone will rent the property from you. And even the things that you don't want to do, I don't want to take calls from tenants. I don't want to deal with contractors. You can even, you know, take a little bit of a haircut and hire someone else to do. So if this person is maxing out their 401k um, and they're doing, you know, all the other things, and I don't know exactly what the money's for, so I can't provide advice, you know, specifically um, for their situation, but you know, assuming they uh, don't want to put more money in lazy investments, I would look at obviously uh, a real estate portfolio. I mean, 150 grand. If they leverage some of it, I mean, they could buy they could buy a lot of cash flowing properties with that kind of money. Absolutely, very cool. Yeah. And fully, that's like 40 houses. <laughs> <laughs> Man, um, so what was your most successful deal? My most successful deal um, in real estate. Um, so one of the deals I, I mentioned earlier, um, I don't know if it was my most successful one, but it was certainly my, um, my favorite one. So my most successful, my, my real estate purchases that I did down in South Philly back in 2011, I mean, arguably the $150,000, $160,000 that I invested in, the, in three of those houses down there, which today is probably worth three quarters of a million bucks, maybe slightly more. I mean, that was obviously a great investment. Um, my favorite deal was um, rehabbing a property, bought a house in West Philly, paid 43,000 for it, put maybe 40,000 worth of work into it, sold it for 140,000, which that doesn't really get investors that, you know, it's like a really big deal. Um, but the neat thing was um, we in turn uh, bought the house from the people who bought the house from us. So it was like a double closing. Um, and it was really neat because I brokered the entire transaction. I'm not a licensed realtor, so it was all like kind of new, dealing with their questions, and they were like harassing me about stuff. Um, but we didn't have to obviously pay any commissions because I brokered the whole deal. We just went to closing. Um, we didn't obviously have to come to the table with any cash. They financed the purchase, so they didn't have to come to the table with any cash, and they left with cash as well because they, you know, they financed some of the deal. Um, and we bought their house. Uh, so they left with some checks in their pocket. We left with checks in our pockets and both of us left with properties. Hmm. Uh, and I think the reason why I think it was probably one of the most successful deals is because with a large chunk of the profits from the house we flipped, we bought their house. We paid 50000 for it and a house um, two doors down uh, is now on the market for two ninety. So <laughs> we... Um, 
we definitely made out in that deal. And, you know, at the time, again, going back to how most people, you know, most people would have said, all right, I'm getting $140,000 for this house. I'm going to spend it all. You know, I, I need it. I'm, back, I'm behind on my work. You know, we, we took most of the profits that we actually made from it, um, used it to buy that $50,000 house. And now it's, you know, it's worth far more than even the other house that we sold, the flip house. Yeah. So that was a good deal. So you, I think you've given this example a few times, but um, why, what's the purpose of buying somebody else's house when they're buying a house from you? Um, so it's funny because I actually recommended to them, um, I said, listen, you know, because they needed to sell their house. They wanted to buy our, they, they were buying our rehab house. It was a family. Um, and I said, I said to them, why don't you keep your own property, fix it up and rent it out? Because I, you know, if I believe, if I genuinely believe this is a good way to build wealth, that's what I told them to do. I wasn't actually even considering or interested initially in buying their property, but they were like, listen, you know, we don't want to listen to a realtor. We feel comfortable with you. So we want you to buy the house and we have to sell it in order to buy the new house because they needed the, they needed to, needed the funds. So they insisted. I, I gave them a number, um, which I think was a fair number given the condition of the house. Um, and this was over a year ago. So at the time, the block, that block is still a little, little iffy. Um, it was a fair number for the house. They took it and they knew they didn't have to pay any real estate, uh, realtor commissions on it because, I, again, I was brokering the whole deal. So they walked with most of the 50. Um, and you know, they kind of insisted. So it, it ended up being now looking back on it in retrospect, it ended up being a great deal for us. You know, I try not to, because I still talk to the family. I, I try not to let them know what houses are now selling for in their block, but I think they know. Um, but yeah, I'm always looking for houses. I'm always looking for deals, you know? So when they, when they insisted, I, you know, of course I, I bought it. That's cool. I think one of the, the best things that I took from this interview is that like, you're frugal with your work income, but you're also frugal with your investment income. And it seems like you aren't necessarily just playing the real estate game for the money, but you're also kind of playing it for the game of it. And I think that that's really cool because it's like, if you just play it because you enjoy it, you'll look up and you'll be wealthy. But if you're playing it, chasing a buck, you're going to make the buck and then buy a Bentley. And yeah. so, so many people are playing it for the purpose of getting rich, not because they love real estate. Yeah. And I'm not sure that that's going to end too well for certain people, but, um, yeah, that's, that's some scary stuff. And I mean, I was just saying to someone the other day, um, so I did finally buy a nice car. Um, and the only reason I bought this car is because my car literally died. I mean, my transmission went, I had 175,000 miles on my, on my 2008 car and it like, it literally gave up, but I would have, I had, I, had, I hadn't had a car payment in like, I don't know, years. Um, I would have driven that thing forever if it let me, but it, you know, it didn't work out that way. It died. So I had to get, and I finally, I finally got, you know, a, a nicer, a nice car, but yeah, I'm, 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 I'm pretty frugal. Um, and I think that's okay, you know, because I think that in the end, um, my sacrifices and dedication and, and discipline will pay off. Yeah. A lot of people that I talk to, you're the, not the second person I've had this conversation with, but a lot of people, they say they spent their 20 and their thirties instead of turning up they were just saving up and buying property. So um, there's somebody else on Instagram named Investor and he was a great guest. He did the exact same thing. He lived yeah. frugal, he took his paychecks and he started with a paycheck and he started building it and snowballing it into wealth. It's kind of like the whole book Snowball really talks about. It's like the snowball of wealth. Yeah. Pretty soon your wealth makes you more wealth. You said his name was what on Instagram? It's Investor, underscore okay. Investor, no no uh, vowels. Okay, that's funny because that's my, that's my, um, my license plate. <laughs> Yeah. That's cool. That's what it's all about. Two quick questions. What is your favorite book of all time? My favorite book of all time is probably not a business book, actually. Um, I spent most of my high school years like walking around just reading books, uh, a, bit of a, a bit of a nerd. Um, my favorite book is probably The Color Purple or maybe Sula um, by uh, Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. um, those two, Alice Walker, Toni Morrison, but those are probably... One of, one of them is my favorite. Yeah. What's your favorite business book? My favorite business book? Um, probably Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Nice. I read many, many years ago, and I've picked it up um, sporadically over the years. But, um, you know, I was, I was fortunate to grow up 
professionally in, um, in a culture that believed a whole lot in leadership development. So I was forced to kind of, because I, I, I actually won't by choice, unless it's a Warren Buffett book, uh, I won't by choice read business periodicals. And that's, you know, most people think, you know, oh, you got to be like, so business, like, I don't listen to podcasts. Um, I, I finally, I think for the first time, maybe three months ago, listened to a podcast. It was like the Bigger Pockets mm-hmm. thing. Um, so I, I, but I, I, and they're very interesting, but I just, I'd rather listen to music in my car. I mean, there's got to be a, a point where I like, I can actually do something else. Sorry, it's loud and I'm in, in the city of fire alarms and stuff. But, um, yeah, I Seven Habits is a great book, but I don't generally read business books. Awesome. Last question is, what does wealth mean to you? Independence, choice, freedom, um, the ability to do exactly what you want to do. Um, that's wealth to me. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on the show. Um, I apologize again for forgetting your name in the beginning. I feel bad about that. But um, where can people find out more um, about you, I guess? I mean, I know that for the most part, your career is um, top secret, but maybe somebody has a question that they could come to you about talking like the person who had that question about the 150. Yeah, no, I mean, the best thing to do is um, I'm not on Twitter as much. I do have a Twitter account, but um, I'm on Instagram quite a bit. Um, people DM me, um, and I usually uh, can answer questions through um, uh, a DM. Um, I'm on Instagram as at Aisha Selden. So uh, all one word, no underscores, A-Y-E-S-H-A-S-E-L-D-E-N. So that's the best place uh, probably to find me. I usually post a lot of real estate stuff, tips. I usually try to help out new investors as much as possible um, by giving some some information. I have one last question for you. How did you get that water bill down from 15,000 to like a hundred bucks? So it was 10 grand. It was like 10,600. Um, it was a Philly share of sale. And a lot of investors either don't know this in Philly. And I don't know, again, every munis- municipality is different. So it was a $10,600 water bill that we had on a property that we bought from a Philadelphia share of sale. Um, and either most investors, because the bill's not large enough or they just don't know how to go about uh, doing it, um, this particular property had, I think, like a $12,000 city tax lien against it. And we only paid like twelve grand for the house. So most people assume that because there's not enough that's paid to the city, any other outstanding liens that are from the city, that they, they're responsible for them. But that's actually not the case. Even if the city doesn't make enough money on the tax lien to satisfy the other liens, they're still supposed to absolve you of any other gas liens, water liens, even if there wasn't enough money to go around. Mm -hmm. So in this particular case, that's exactly what happened. Um, Tax lien was about 12,000. There was also a $10,000 water bill against the property. Um, We paid about 12,000 for the house. Um, So we get this $10,000 water bill from the city. They're like, give us our money. So I basically just went down to the sheriff's office, harassed the heck out of them. Like, look, this was supposed to get cleared. Um, and they did, they took care of it for me. And what most people think is they're fighting with the water department and the water department doesn't really know what's going on. So I've got friends and investors who were inboxing me, like, how did you take care of this? I've literally been fighting this for like seven months and you have to just go down to the sheriff's office, which most people don't think to do. They're trying to fight it with the water company. So yeah, it was, it was taken care of. So we ended up, we, we ended up owing from the time we actually bought the house to now, like whatever the, not usage because no one lives in the house, but there was like a, there's like a mandatory like storm water fee or something like, like that. So we ended up with a, a bill of like 170 bucks, which that compared to almost 11 grand, I'll take all day. Nice, nice. Awesome. Well, thank you again for coming on the show. No um, problem. Thank you so much for having me. It was fun. This has been episode number 42 of the Millionaire Podcast. If you want to join any of our investment clubs, email us at info at capitaltod.com. The website is capitaltod.com. You can also find me on the internet at Todd Millionaire.